Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, and one of the founding partners of the Dividend Kings Marketplace service on Seeking Alpha. I've got a very interesting video. As you can see, today, I'm going to be talking about American Tower Corporation. And this is a tower REIT that, you know, referred to as a specialized REIT, but build cell tires all over the world, actually. And the company is very interesting. It's one that I followed for years and years. But it was recently a really excellent article was published by Brad Thomas and uh, Williams Equity Research, two colleagues of mine on the Dividend King service. And they talked about it as being a buy and being attractive. And then there were some subscribers to Dividend Kings that felt the stock was still pricey. And there was even some of the Dividend Kings that felt that way too. So we kind of got into a, a nice debate. It was very amicable, very cordial, and very intellectual, I might add. But we got really discussing the fair value or relative valuation of American Tower. And as this happened, it kind of occurred to me that there was really some, even some issues in how my colleagues and even some of the subscribers were actually utilizing FastGraphs, which I call the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool or tool to think with. It's an analytical tool. It doesn't dictate fair value. It reveals it. But it's like any tool. It has to be used properly to be of real value. So this gives me a chance to really talk about fair value, how important it is, what it really means. But even more to the point, it allows me to, to illustrate how you can most effectively utilize FastGraph. So I'm going to go ahead and take my pretty face off here. And let's get into American Tire. Now, number one is... I've got the traditional adjusted operating earnings metric up here. And as you can see, as it is with most REITs, operating earnings don't work very well. You don't really find a correlation with REITs because REITs are a special animal. You know, they have under the 1960 law, they must pay out 90% of their distributable cash or funds available for distribution, as it's often called. They also get very special pass-through tax considerations. But to do that or to get that, they also have to invest in real estate. So REITs are kind of a unique animal. As a result, the metric that has been most commonly used to value REITs historically has been funds from operations. Now, in fast graphs, if you go to operating cash flow and you have a REIT symbol in your symbol, you will automatically bring up FFO or funds to operations. And we will look at the stock from the standpoint of the price to funds from operations. Now, I'm going to make some interesting points here about American Tower and talk about valuation a little bit. The first thing you should be able to recognize as you look at this graph is the fact that Mr. Market values this at a premium valuation. The normal calculated price to FFO multiple over this time frame is 22.29. You can see that very clear. That's the blue line on this graph. But that number, although accurate, is a statistic. And some of the debate we had was, you know, that's, you know, if you want to own American Tower, you got to pay 22 plus times earnings to buy it. Well, that's only partially true, because let me review some of the detail here of what's really happened. Number one is we've got two recessions on this graph. We got the recession of 01, which was relatively short. You can see American Tower was very expensive back then, trading at almost 78 times FFO. And then, of course, it reverted to the mean, if you will, and it got really inexpensive. The price to FFO actually got into low single digits and mid single digits, but it stayed around this 15 price to FFO, which is the orange line on this graph, for almost four years here. And then it got overvalued. And then we had prices to FFO of around 28 or 29. And then the second Great Recession came in, and the stock again reverted to the mean and traded. You could have bought it for about a year's time at around a 15 price to FFO. But even a year or two after that, it was trading below this 22 number. Now, I want to make another point here. When you're looking at these historical graphs, that's the dark green shaded area and the dark orange line. That's nonfiction. That's real data. That's factual. Fast graphs tell a data story. And the data story is one that you need to read. You need to actually think about it. So I've got a number here, which is kind of a valuation reference. But as I look at this company, you know, if I wanted to invest in this stock, there are plenty of opportunities for me to buy it at a price to FFO below 22. So well, all I'm really suggesting here is that happens with this read. Occasionally, the market undervalues it. Now, on the other hand, it also has traded at around a 20 multiple consistently or 22 multiple. And, and that 20 multiple becomes very important because I'm going to talk about why that's relevant here a little bit later in this video. But the thing I want to point out is 
that valuation matters because it will affect the amount of money that you can make by investing in any given stock. So I'm going to stick with FFO here for a while. And the reason I say that is a lot of people like AFFO as a better metric. So if I looked at fast graphs from the standpoint of adjusted funds from operations, which you know adds back some depreciation and some other accounting conventions in there. In this particular company, note the numbers down here at the bottom of the graph, 849, 925, and 990. If I you know go back into the FFO numbers, I've got 849, 925, and 993. Very similar numbers. And there's a reason for that, which I'll show you here in a moment. But I want to use the FFO on this particular presentation because I wanted you to see this long-term history. Okay, now another thing I want to do is I want to point out that the company, you know, started paying a dividend in 2012. You can see that by the white line and, the, and then the dividends, you know, taken from below the white line and stacked on top to illustrate total return, you know, dividends plus capital appreciation. But I want to go back, I want to grab my scrolling bar here, and I want to go back in time to when this was more, almost really a pure growth read. It really was. And if I look at it here, now I'm using the price to FFO equal to the growth rate formula, and my orange line becomes an 18.9, or right around a 19 price to FFO. Now, my normal price to FFO is still in that 22-ish range, 21.78. 21.8 rounded. But I want you to notice that the correlation here was very, very profound. The stock price went where the company's FFO results went. Now, it was significantly overvalued coming into the 2001 recession. It reverted to the mean. And then you had this period of almost four years, again, where you could buy this REIT at a very attractive multiple. It was below the 20, and it was actually in the 14 range. Then we had a period as we entered the, the Great Recession where we got into these very high multiples, about 20 29-ish, but then the stock reverted to the mean. But here's what I want to focus your attention on. Look at the growth rate here, 18.95%. Now, if I grab my scroll bar and start moving it forward a few years, and I start getting close to where we, you know, to the point where we started paying a dividend, my growth rate has fallen to about 15%. Now, I move that again further ahead still, and now my growth rate, and I'm here ending in 2019, my growth rate has fallen to 13%. 0.41%, and I move that all the way over, and now my growth rate's down to 11%. But I also want you to notice down here at the bottom of the graph that we had double-digit growth rates up through 2000. 18, and then we had a negative growth rate in 2019, followed by 7%, 9%, and then forecast for 7 and 6. This is funds from operations. That's the forecast we have here, okay? So the bottom line is the growth rate has begun to slow down. Okay, now there was one of the controversies we had. If you looked at the operating earnings and went to forecasting graph on operating earnings, we got a number of around 14.73%. That was the estimated operating earnings forecast. Now, this is very interesting because REITs, as I mentioned earlier, are unique. So I want to do something a little different. I want to go into fund graphs here, and I want to look at American Tower, and I want to look at common shares outstanding. Okay, I want you to see a couple of things here. The company was increasing shares dramatically from, you know, 2001 recession up into 2006. And then since 2006, they actually reduced shares for a few years, kept them level for a few years. And then they've been gently raising the share count again since about 2016. But the point is they're staying around that 400 million share count where they started out at about 192 millions in 2001. Now, this is... You know, dilution is a common hallmark, if you will, of REITs because they're real estate investments and they require capital to buy additional real estate because that's really important because that real estate is what generates revenue. Now, this is total net revenues here looking at the at the stock. And I want you to see that when they were you know issuing all those shares, the, the actual revenues decreased a little bit. And then, you know, since they've been holding them the same, they've really grown quite a bit. If I look at this from revenue per share, we see that more dramatically, you know, because of the change in share count, revenues dropped. But then, you know, since 2006, we've had this incredible increase in revenues averaging about almost 12% a year. So that's one of the real benefits of investing in this particular REIT. Okay, so, you know, the reason why earnings don't work too well with REITs is because their capital structure changes. But in this company, you actually get a pretty good, you know, 
consistent growth in earnings per share, which is why we have this forecast of a 14.73% forecast in earnings. But the point is, I'm not going to use that metric. I'm going to go to FFO and even preferably to AFFO, which are very similar, as I pointed out, but we just don't have as long a data period. Companies only more recently in the last decade or so have been reporting FFO, which many read experts, including people like Brad Thomas, believe is the preferred metric to value them. And I don't argue that at all. But what I really want to get across, I'm going to stick with the FF because I want the long term, you know, look here. I want you to see some things and I want to talk about valuation a little bit. OK, first of all, I want you to look at some time frames here. Let's say I would have bought this stock just before the recession came and I would have paid a price to FFO of twenty nine. Now, that's overvalued by the definition of a 22, you know, fair value FFO or market value, normal value FFO. If I would have done that about a year later, I want you to very quickly see that I would have actually seen about a 40 percent drop in the value of this REIT. So from that point of view, valuation is very, very important. And a lot of people you know, would have a great deal of trouble seeing a 40 percent hit on their capital. And this is before the REIT was even issuing dividends. Now, if I go back and redo that and carry that all the way out to now, even though I overpaid for this REIT, I would have made almost 13% a year, 12.7 annualized. I'd have turned $10,000 into 49,000 and I'd have picked up 4,900 and change of dividends. So, you know, that's really been a great return. So when you've got a company that grows this consistently, even if you're cavalier with valuation and even if you overpay, if the company continues to deliver, then, you know, you can still earn a pretty healthy rate of return. But here's where valuation is really interesting. What if you'd have waited nine months, okay, and instead of buying the stock when it was trading at that very high valuation, like I showed you here, what if you bought it when it was trading at a low valuation, a, a priced FFO of 14, and held it to yesterday's close? Instead of 49,000, 10,000 would have grown to 73,000. And instead of 4,900 dividends, you get $8,200 in dividends. And all you did was wait about a year to buy the stock when the valuation, I call this intelligent patience. Those of you who followed my work have heard me say that before. So by being very strict with valuation, I would have increased my rate of return dramatically. Uh, and I'd have increased, you know, the total amount of money I have and the total dividends I received dramatically. And I, I would have done it by holding this particular stock for a shorter period of time. So valuation matters and matters a lot. But now let's move into talking about how this stock is actually valued. Now, if I look at forecasting here with FFO, analysts are expecting about 7.27%. If I go to my AFFO and I look at forecasting, analysts are looking at about seven, I'm hitting the wrong buttons here, excuse me. If I go to this normal multiple, I've got a 7.27% on the funds from operations and on the AFFO. So, you know, I'm getting lost here, but the point is I've got about a 7% forecast. Now, when I've built these calculators, you know, valuation is not a perfect science. You can't get valuation precise. There are a lot of reasons that I won't go into in this video, but the point I want to make is, you know, I've purposely created what I call a valuation corridor. So we've got the orange line on the graph using the Graham-Dodd formula, but since this company has historically traded at this premium valuation, I can buy the argument that maybe using the normal multiple around the 21 or 22. Now, I can pick what multiple I want to use here based on historical numbers. So I can even go a little higher and go into that 22 0.25 multiple. And now what I've got is that the stock is within these four bars here. I've got the normal PE line here, which is in this case a 22.25. But then I've got a 24 PE and a 26 PE, which all of the, this would be, you know, full value and high value. This would be margin of safety value. And this would be a real margin of safety value, if you will. OK, but I'm on based on this normal multiple that the market's applied, you know, I've got an opportunity here to make about eight and a half percent or so over the next several years, assuming all this stuff happens as it was supposed to be. If the multiple fell, let's say, back down to that 15, I would basically break even. And that happened a couple of times in history, as I talked about before. But the real key is here, these forecasting calculators are allowing me to look at this stock. So if I'm comfortable saying I'm willing to 
pay this 20 multiple, and I'm very confident that that's going to continue to hold that multiple, or even a 20 multiple, and this is where it gets important, I would still make 6% a year. Now I want to move on a little bit and talk about what some of the other services out there, and this came up in the discussion, other firms like Morningstar gives American Tower a fair value of $190 a share, and that would indicate that they think it's moderately overvalued, and they call this a very high uncertainty that that's true. Now, the reason they, how they calculate that fair value, if I scroll down here through the Morningstar website here and come to fair value, they argue the 190 fair value is based on a price to AFFO multiple of 20 and an enterprise value to EBITDA multiple of 19. Okay, now let's kind of look at that from through the lens of fast graphs. If I go to fun graphs here and go to my ratios graph, and I look at valuation ratios, I can look at enterprise value to EBITDA. And what I see here over all these years, I see an enterprise value to EBITDA that is pretty common in this 20-ish range. You can see all these, you know, above this vertical line here or horizontal line here are around 20. And then the current enterprise value to EBITDA or as uh, through 2019, which as far as I go right here, was actually higher. But the point is, that's not an unrealistic assessment, the company's historically done that, but there are also periods where it gets a lot below that. So Morningstar likes a 20, you know, or a 19 enterprise value to EBITDA number, but they also like a 20 price to AFFO. So let's go to the AFFO line here and let's look at a 20 multiple. Now this blue line right here is 21. This blue line is 19. So if they're talking 2021 numbers, if I go to this you know, 19, I get a fair value of 180. If I go to the 21, I get a fair value of 194. That pretty much mirrors the fair value of 190 times, you know, 20 times AFFO, if you will, that Morningstar is predicting. Okay, but here's another niche or twist about Morningstar that a lot of people overlook. Their definition of fair value is different than mine. Okay, their fair value definition is a three-star recommendation. They go all the way up to five stars. Their five-star price is $114. So let's go in there and test this $114 would be closer to what I've got here on fast graphs using the AFFO metric, if you will, trading at, you know, about a 13 or 14 price to AFFO, I get closer to that number. Now, if I use the FFO number, I get even a little closer to that. So those numbers aren't totally crazy, but my point is their five-star price is 114. That would be my personal definition, 120, 125, 115. None of those numbers make a real difference, as I kind of illustrated earlier, would give me what this company is really worth you know, going forward. So, you know, the long and short of it is, as I look at American Tower, it got very pricey in 2020. It's coming back and reverting to the mean. But I also need to look at things like, how's that tendency going? Now, you know, today's quote, the stock is down, you know, 1%. You know, it's actually fallen below 200, at least temporarily. That's as of 12.50 central time there. So, you know, it's down below this 200 level that, you know, that it closed at yesterday. It's moving closer into to alignment with this blue line, if you will. And the question is, is it going to go all the way down into these categories? Is it going all the way down to the orange line? None of us actually know. But if I bought it today and held it for the long run, I would probably make great money. But I don't believe it makes sense to think of this as a 12% grower. I think it makes more sense to think of this as a 7 or 8% grower. And therefore, I think you can use the normal multiple and come up with about a 7 you know, or a eight, seven to eight percent, you know, rate of return, which is very solid from a company of such high quality. So valuation is not perfect. It's never a perfect science. But what I hope you got here was some ideas and understanding of how to use valuation and think about valuation. But more importantly, I want to make sure you understood those of you who are subscribers, how to use the tool. Don't just sit there and say 22 times you know, FFO is the right number because I can see here I've got lots of opportunity to buy this stock at below 22 times the number. It's not this number that matters. It's how the number's made. That's why I call this a valuation reference line and a tool to think with. I analyze the data I'm looking at. I personally would like to see this stock a little cheaper. I think you could buy it now and do fine, but I would like to see it a little cheaper. I think it's a great 
read. I think its growth, you know, is very well defined. But I don't think, given the size, the fact that this is a hundred and twenty-five billion dollar, you know, REIT now, which is very large for REIT them. You know, I just think the company needs to come down a little more. But this is certainly one, at the very least, you should have closely on your watch list because if you get an opportunity to buy this stock cheaper, you ought to jump on it. And maybe now you could start building a position even. I wouldn't even object to that and then be, you know, adding to that position over time. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival saying I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you got some insights into the importance of valuation. But I also hope you learned a little bit about how to use a tool like Fast Graphs more effectively. You have to analyze Every fast graph tells a data story, but you do have to read the story. You have to know what you're looking. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give me a like. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, you know, share this video with others if you think it would be meaningful to them. And I want to thank everybody for all their support over all these years. Thanks for watching.